Brother Timothy, as this happens, you need to teach the church what it means to be God. Because there will be confusion about how to dress, how to act, how to speak, how to marry, how to eat. And you will be a good minister, Timothy, if you teach them about godliness. So look at verse 7. Look at what he says. Have nothing to do with these godless, godless myths of society. Or with the old wise tales. In other words, the gossip things that people are sharing in life. The stories that people make up. Rather, here's his command. Train yourself to be godly. Now notice, that means that you and I must take on the responsibility. It's not up to someone else. It is up to you and to me to train ourselves to be godly. So how are we going to do that? I mean, we must train ourselves. Like the picture here. We must be willing to put ourselves under the load and do the work necessary to become godly. Now Paul has already told them that we are saved by grace through faith. God is the one who comes to live in you. God is the one who will be working in you. But you must partner with the Holy Spirit. You must work with God. You must be committed to train yourself. If you decide you're going to be lazy, if you decide, well, I'm not really going to open the Word and read. I'm not really going to even show up faithfully and put myself under the preaching of the Word. I'm not even going to get involved in discipleship groups or mentoring groups or accountability groups. I'm not going to do any of that because after all, I'm just going to eat, drink, and be married. Because after all, don't you believe that once you're saved, you're always saved? And therefore, once you're saved, you're going to go to heaven? Yes, you believe that. But we also believe that because you are saved, God calls you to live a godly life. Can you say amen? Godly lives. So what does it mean to live a godly life? Look what he says. Physical training is of some value. Now he is not in any way diminishing physical training. He's not saying you shouldn't watch out for what you eat and you shouldn't work out and you should take care of your body. And that's extremely important. That's a given. But in comparison, if you spend a tremendous time working out every morning and watching your diet and doing all that, and you do nothing for your soul, you miss it. Because physical training is of some value. But notice what he says. Godliness has value for all things. It affects everything in your life. Both now, promise in this life, and promise in the life of God. In other words, if you were to spend as much time as you do in physical things, on spiritual things, it would not only give great promise to us now, but it would also give us promise to live in eternally. In fact, that's why we were a little homesick. Because one of these days, we get to go into the presence of God. If we know Him. And if we are willing to pursue Him in Godliness. Look at verse 9. This is a trustworthy saying. It deserves full acceptance. In other words, this is the truth that you need to really apply your life to. For this we labor and we strive also to be with energy and passion in this. That we may put our hope in the living God who is the Savior for all men. And especially for those who believe. In other words, God is the one and only God who can save us. He's the Savior of everyone. But those who know him, he's their Savior. Command and teach these things. Do not let anyone look down on you because of your youth, but set an example for the believers. 
to do so much, all that will follow is, have you made God the center of your life? Are you living God centered? When you talk about your marriage, is God the center of your marriage? When you're talking about parenting, is God the center of parenting? On Sunday morning, when you get up, do you stop and say, hey, I want to be God centered? God, what do you want me to do today? Because we live in a culture that is constantly confusing, distracting, and leading us to all kinds of things, especially things that have to do with physical activity. But what if we pursue those things that have some value? And we plan the things that really matter. That of worshiping God, that of living for God, that of God being the center of my life. See, God did not choose you and call you so that He could be added to your life. He chose you to be saved. He called you to come into His kingdom through Jesus Christ so that He could be the center of your life. So God wants to be at the very center of your life. The second thing that he shows us in verse 12, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but set an example. You know what that means? It means not only to be God's center, but am I God-like? Is there a God likeness in my life. And he begins to expand upon that. We'll come back to that in a minute. These are the two things that you have to ask yourself. And I, I consider whether I'm godly or not. It's not that I succeed today, that I win today, that I do everything right. It is these two things that Paul is addressing to Timothy. Because if God is at the center of everything in your life, he will work his way out. And if in your life you are becoming godlike, in the way you think, in the way you speak, in the way you act, in the way you treat others. And you can be assured that God is working in you to make you to be God. On Thanksgiving, the reason I say that Thanksgiving is God shows most clearly in God that you live because the thing that God wants the most in your life and my life it's not for us to say thank you for saving us. Not for us to even sing praises to him, although he loves that. The real thing he longs for is to know that his children are becoming like him. That his children have him as the center of everything. That he is first. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else See, that becomes the heart of the Christian. Am I really seeing God at work? I'm not working for my boss or working to produce a product or working to have money. Work has become the worship that God is at the center of my heart. And therefore, everything I do, showing up on time, putting in my effort, treating others, accomplishing the task, doing whatever is required in order that when I do, I do it for God. Because God is the center. And God is the ambition. Who put me in that job, in that teaching, in that coaching, in that working, in that ranching, in that serving, in that business? He put me in that position so he could be the center of everything I do. And when other people look at me, they begin to see Jesus because of my God likeness. Now, to illustrate, I want to show you two things that come out of this passage because he will list five things and then he will talk about four things, and Paul is very explicit in this. So, what I try to do is give you a picture of this. Look at the triangle of godliness. If we are to really be godly, then we have to possess this triangle in our life. Now, God loves triangles. In fact, God Himself is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is three in one. And so these three come together in him. It's amazing how when God makes a marriage, he has God and a husband and a wife to come together. When God made a family, he had a husband and a wife and a child to make a triangle. God is always involved in this kind of movement to reflect who he is, his fingerprint, his DNA of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So when we say, I'm really God, it's God at the center of my life that I have to evaluate three things in my life. Number one is, what is the desire? 
desire of God in my life. That is the pathos. That is the passion of life. What is it that I'm really passionate about? What is that that moves me and gives me the desire to live? When I get up in the morning, what is it that makes me want to rise out of bed and go into the day? When I'm living life, what is it that guides me and draws me? Because it's something that is the direction, the pathos, the motivation of my life. It is the desire of God. Paul would say it this way, Oh, I want to know him. I want to know him. And I want to experience the power of his resurrection. And I want to become like him, even in dying, so that I may attain to the resurrection. That was the passion of the apostle. Look at the second thing. The love of God. God loved us so much that he gave. He gave his son, the Logos, to come into the world. And the Word was with God, and the Word became flesh on one. 12 through 14 tells us. And that Word is life and light. And so the love of God. When Paul writes in Corinthians about it, he says, Now abide three things. Three and faith, hope, and love. We need faith to enter into a relationship. We need love as a sustaining thing, and we need that hope, to look forward to the day when we will be with him for all eternity, without any sin, without anything, to rob us of God, and to take us away from that God we live in. And so the love of God, do we really love him? Is he deep in our heart? Do we come today out of love for God? And when people see us, do they say, hi, how they love one another, my how they love God. And then there is that loss. That is the ethical side. Sometimes people forget that. There's a reason there's a fear of God. Because God is holy. And He demands that we do the right thing. He demands that we live in obedience to what is good and not evil. That's why all affection is not good. That's why all obsessions are not good. You can fall in love with ice cream. You can fall in love with an animal. You can fall in love with yourself. All of which are perversions of what God wants. And the fear of God comes in to say, this is what's right. This is the ethical, this is the ethos of life. So in order to truly live a godly life, there must be all three of these working together so that God is at the center as we are passionately following Him, as we are lovingly growing in a relationship, and as we are becoming holy so that we honor Him more. That is reflected in our lifestyle. So we come to the second part. If we are to be God centered back in godliness, how about the circle of godliness? Look at the next slide, the circle. In the circle of godliness, there are two parts. One is what we do, and the other is who we are. You say, well, why is it, why is it a circle? It, shouldn't it be that who we are becomes what we do? Well, it is a circle. And it is a circle of God working in our life. Because I became a Christian as a sinner who often did not do what God wanted. But God came to live in me. And He began to say, follow me. As I began to do the right thing by following Him, He begins to change who I am. As He changes who I am, I begin to act in a different way. And as I begin to act in a different way, then what I do, again, begins to inform who I am. And it is a constant circle of growing. So this is what Paul says in this. Timothy, set an example for everyone. Set an example in your speech. So I listen to how God wants me to speak, and I become godlike in speaking like God, and it makes me more godly. I begin to live my life the way God wants, and He begins to change me to be more like Him, and I begin to reflect Him. I begin to love others the way He loves them, not the way the world loves them, with prejudice over culture and socioeconomics and personalities, parties. But I begin to love the pure love because He is in me, and I become more like Him. I begin to live life by faith, not what I can see, but what I believe. And 
and I began to be more holy in purity as I began to live out what God wants. I'm putting these together. Look at the next few verses. He says, devote yourself to the Scripture. How do you make God the center of your life? You focus on the Scripture. So as you put the Scripture into you, you become more like the Scripture, and God begins to reside in you even more. You become more godly by Him being the center of your life. You begin not to do like you give, because after all, when you were saying, it's all the Spirit came to live in you and gave you gifts to be used to bless others in the body. And gifts to make others know God as you become more godlike. And so our passion is seen as we study the Word, as we live out our gifts. But then look at our love. Our love is seen in verse 15. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself holy to them. When you give yourself holy to anything, we are in love with it. You love football, you can't miss that game. You love food, you can't miss that meal. You are diligent in the things you love. That's why you cannot say, oh, I love my church and not be diligent in it. Or I love God and not be a giver and a server. Because your love and your desire will reflect if you are really godly or not. And so God begins to work in us to show us what it means. And then look at the fear of God in verse 16. Watch your life. That word is literally examine your life and what you believe very closely. Pull out the microscope, get out of the doctor, get out some readers, and say, and look at your life and say, Am I really godly? Am I letting God be the sinner? The alarm went off this morning, but at the time, you awoke. It was the first thought of God. Thank you for this day. God, today I'll be a new day with you. God, I want to pursue you. Tomorrow we go to work. Will He be the center of everything you do? Whether you are teaching or working, whether you are selling or building, will God be the center of it? So that you say, God, I want to love you. I want to show you how much. Passion I have for you. Watch your life and watch what you believe. Can't tell you how many times people come to my office and say things, you know, like uh, uh, I used to love that person, but I don't love them anymore. I don't really think God says His word. I just said that's old fashioned. I don't think you have to live like that anymore. After all, people can choose what they want. They didn't know the science we know today. In fact, my 